Thank you for joining us. My name is Peter Bergen. I'm Vice President at New America. We're delighted to have Peter Pomerantsev uh, with his new book, How to Win an Inform Information War. Uh, Peter is a senior fellow um, at the Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University, where he co-directs the Arena Initiative. He's also the author of Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, The Surreal Heart of the New Russia, uh, which won the 2016 Royal Society of Literature Prize. And, and this is not propaganda, adventures in the war against reality. He's one of the world's leading experts on propaganda and disinformation. And very happy uh, that he can uh, talk about his new book uh, with us today. Over to you, Peter. Thank you, everybody, for for, for joining. Um, I can't I can't see you, so it's always this sort of sense that I'm talking into a void. But I know you're there. I can feel you. <laughs> um, so listen, I am um, very much sort of a, 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 a student, a researcher, um, and someone who looks for solutions to our current crises of echo chambers and polarization and extremism and alternative facts. Um, Russia was really my original focus, but I've expanded that to look at other places in the world. And now I live in the US where I'm I'm sort of doing this, sort of like starting to look at it, sort of trembling with, with um, all sorts of mixed feelings. Um, but this book was a bit of a departure for me in the sense that it's a book that looks at, at a historical character um, who um, was essentially head of Britain's special operations to undermine Nazi propaganda in the Second World War. Um, a bit of a COVID book in the sense that I think a lot of us went on to decided to try something new in COVID, can do our usual kind of reporting or research. So I was like, okay, I have access to the archive and um, let's get into this. And I was fascinated, you know, like somebody who works in this space, I'm very frustrated because we can see how many things aren't working. We can see propaganda winning across the world. And here was someone who tried something completely different, um, out of the box, unorthodox, and um, which I think has strange and unexpected lessons for us today. So let me start with D-Day. I've been told by my um, by my by my publicist actually that when you do things in America about the Second World War, you've got to start with D-Day. Um, <laughs> in Britain, we'd start with the Blitz because that's kind of our big moment, but it's got to be D-Day with Americans. So I'm going to start with a scene from D-Day. You know, what? I'm not actually going to read it because that's just too too. That's not the right energy. I'll just tell you what happened. Um, so D-Day, um, the first radio station to scoop, essentially, the, the uh, Allies had landed on D-Day before Nazi, well, before official Nazi radio stations had, was something called uh, the Soldatenzender Calais, which gave this news, I think, at 4.10 a.m., so before, you know, other... German stations. So as you can tell, it was a German station. And I suppose to the first time listener, they would have thought it was a Nazi station. It had speeches by Goering and Goebbels and Hitler and the rest of that gruesome crew. Um, it had um, official news flashes, communications from um, Nazi HQ. But it also then had other things in it. And the things it had in it were, apart from some great jazz, which was already a little bit suspicious because you weren't meant to do too much jazz in Nazi Germany. Didn't have naughty words in it, but had a little bit too much swing music for a regular Nazi station. <laughs> but mainly it gave these incredible visceral descriptions of what life was like for the soldier, the civilian, the Luftwaffe pilot. I mean, I will read you a little bit. I mean, this is in the week after, um, in the week after uh, D-Day, um, describing how the six, 716th Infantry Division has been abandoned by its leadership, how these German soldiers are just wasted on the beach by the oncoming allies. There they lashed and they're smashed and slit up dugouts naked without cover, grenadiers without pistols and machine guns and anti-tank guns. The end of comrades who held out and waited for reinforcements or relief, who did not know they had been written off written off from the very beginning. And it goes on and on like this an incredible description of how German soldiers have been abandoned by their leadership. And look, by this time, you know, you've probably already twigged that this isn't really a Nazi station. This is actually a British station disguised as a Nazi station in order to undermine Nazi morale. Now, if that had been the end of the story, I wouldn't have written this book. 
Because frankly, all sides were doing something like this. The Soviets had stations which pretended to be Nazi stations. The Nazis had stations which pretended to be British stations, which were hilariously bad, actually. <laughs> we can go back to them in the Q&A. The reason I started to write this book was when I realized that the British who were creating the station wanted the Germans to know <clears throat> that they were British cosplaying Nazis. They weren't doing deception. They were putting on a mask to give their audiences cover. So something much more interesting was going on. And what kind of cover? Firstly, safety, because if your officer or the Gestapo walked in, you could say, well, I thought it was a Nazi station, sir. I had no idea. I remember listening to a foreign station was punishable by hanging. But much more interestingly than that, because that still isn't enough reason for me to write a book about it, was psychological cover. So what they had decided, what they'd worked out after several years, was that people psychologically needed the comfort of listening to anti-regime content that was dressed up in the language of us, our boys, we Germans. And cover in a third way. And here we get into the theory of propaganda that the people who designed the stations had. Cover to do what you really wanted to do in the first place, which was not fight, surrender, shirk, get sent home, not send your kids to the front. Because people at home on the home front were listening to these stations as well. So what was happening was not deception in the classic sense, was not disinformation as we define it today but was a consensual masquerade that created an environment where firstly you could communicate facts because as we'll get into, these shows were incredibly well-researched where you could communicate facts and where you could welcome people into a masquerade where they could actually do what they really wanted to do, where they could act themselves. When I realized that, I was like, oh, there's something really interesting going on here. And I became intrigued by the man who was behind this. So the man who was behind this, the, the main character in this book, the man called Sefton Dome. And he was running a whole fleet of stations like this across Europe, stations in Italian, in what was then known as Serbo Croat, in Bulgarian, Romanian, Norwegian, French, and many, many in German. German was his main focus. There's a reason for that. He was born in Germany. Yeah? And I realized with time that actually his personal story was really what you need to do to understand his really fascinating concept of propaganda and practice of propaganda. He was born in Germany as the son of British academics, trapped in Berlin as a kid, 10-year-old kid in the outbreak of the First World War. And in his memoirs, it's really his early experiences which set up his later propaganda practice. I'll land on one really important thing. The amazingly honest thing in Sefton Delma, that was his name, Sefton Delma's memoirs, is how he describes growing up as a British kid in Berlin in the First World War, bullied, put down, humiliated by his classmates for being an enemy schoolchild, but at the same time, caught up and singing along to German war propaganda. And he talks about having this almost split self where he's almost talking to himself. Where like, hold on, I have no right to have these feelings, but I do have these feelings. And so from a very young age, he's aware of the power of propaganda to make you feel part of a group, to articulate desires for, well, sometimes very cruel desires, desires for violence and sadism but also how it's always a tiny bit performed. He's aware that he's both in love with, but performing this propaganda. And when he looks around himself as a child, he sees that all the adults, they're enjoying the propaganda, but it's also kind of a, an act. And they can be very different at another time, same as he's got a British self and a German self. We have many roles that we perform. Later, he goes back to Britain, and is accused of being too German and bullied there and learns to act English. Because of course he's not, you know, he's been bullied for being British. He doesn't belong in Britain. And again, very aware of how you act your social roles. 
Then he goes to Germany and becomes a superstar reporter, a mix of Borat and Tintin for, for the Daily Express, covering the rise of the Nazis. He becomes a master of impersonation. Why I say Borat and Tintin? He's doing serious investigative reporting, but putting on disguises. He becomes a master of disguise in the age of cabaret. And he impersonates Ernst Rohm's assistant to get into a stormtrooper rally. He does many other fun things in the book. But he gets so close to the Nazis, some say too close to the Nazis, that he gets to see their propaganda close up. They allow him to be the only correspondent to accompany Hitler on his air flights from one hysterical rally to the next in the 28 elections. And what does he see? He sees that others have seen this, that Hitler is acting, that Hitler is this morose, blank, he describes him like a traveling salesman eating an egg between performances. And the minute the performance starts, Hitler goes into his role as Messiah. And he dissects it very accurately what exactly that performance is. Now, he's not the first person to, to talk about this. Where Delmer is fascinating, there's only one other person who I've read who talks about this as well, is that the crowd are acting as well. Even in their hysteria, even in the kind of hypnotic moments of crowd ecstasy, there's always a little bit of theater there as well. So skipping forward, when Delma starts designing his sort of cabaret of counter propaganda, he's doing many things. Some of it is quite banal, you know, deceiving Germans as to where the Normandy landings would be, you know, that kind of ABC of deception that is part of every war. But much more than that, he is in his, in the, by the end, dozens of radio stations, doing something that nobody else was doing at the time and I think has some lessons today. Firstly, he says, forget about the German service of the BBC. Forget about preaching democracy. Forget about lectures about how democracy dies in darkness. If you want to reach audiences who are in love and fear of Hitler, you have to do something completely different. If you want to penetrate echo chambers, to use our language today, you have to do something completely different. You've got to firstly tap into the same visceral, satisfying emotions they do. And a lot of the characters in his radio shows are these kind of ranting, often far right um, soldiers who are, in Delma's own words, covering the Nazis with a layer of filth as dirty and as deep as the ones the Nazis flung over Jews. So using that language against the Nazis, finding a language to split the Nazis from people. He called them the Partei, Partei Kommuna, the sort of self-serving corrupt group who are causing normal Germans to suffer. The descriptions are amazing. One of the joys of this book was getting hold of the transcripts of the shows. So we don't have the recordings, we have the transcripts of the radio shows. I spent a lot of COVID reading through the transcripts. It was a bizarre time for all of us. Um, there was porn scenes, non-stop scenes of sadomasochistic um, sex, basically. Um, quite explicit, actually. Um, uh, all these scenes of disease, you know, you take this idea of the, of the body that the Nazis had, of the pure Aryan body, and you do non-stop stories about how Germans were diseased because of the Nazis, how they were suffering physically, how they were getting lice on the front. So really counter-engineering the Nazi emotional architecture. But that's just the start. I mean, that's the first thing you've got to do to just even tap into the same, to be on the same stage as the Nazis. You've got to be working in that space. And then what he did, or well, the essence of what he did, because he did many things, but what he did was try to, through a set of rhetorical techniques, make people aware and sort of shock them into remembering that the roles they play when they follow the Nazis are just roles. Now, what does that mean? Doesn't mean satire. Satire is when you like, you know, very aggressively attack the social roles others play. But that usually backfires if the people are playing those roles. In Britain, we have lots of satire about Brexiteers. I'm not sure they reach Brexit voters. Using something much more subtle, which I think actually we all saw the other day with Senator Britt from Alabama. Well, she wasn't doing satire of MAGA. 
But by going slightly over the top, she suddenly revealed and made you shockingly remember just how artificial MAGA rhetoric is. I don't know if you all saw it. Do see it. It's fascinating. And it's fascinating the reaction from people in her own camp who were shocked because for a moment they were confronted with the artifice of what they try to pass off as the genuine. She actually revealed its nature. And Delma Wright talks about this. She talks about it in a presentation to the King of England, who he had to explain his approach to. Talks about it as taking Nazi propaganda just one step further into the ridiculous. So not satire. Yeah. We can get into Brecht, other theatre directors around whom Delma spent his youth. He was obsessed with theatre. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of relation to a lot of theatrical ideas at the time. That's what he's doing. So first the emotions. So you get rid of the Nazis monopoly on emotions. Then you alienate people from the roles that they've been playing within the Nazi spectacle. And that's just the start. All that does is open up the potential for having a different kind of conversation. And then you tap into their self-interest, individualism, their bonds beyond the bonds of the Nazi folk, their bonds in church, soldier camaraderie, all the other relationships they have. You give them, then you can start giving them lots and lots of information about how to shirk from the front, how to surrender if need be, how to generally disobey the Nazis. He was very interested actually the idea that you have to get people to do something, not just change their attitudes, but actually behavioral change. So it's this arc between wrestling the Nazis' monopoly on emotion, alienating people away from Nazi social roles, and then giving them the chance to do what they want to do. But let's go back to this scene right at the start that I described, where people are listening to the radio, knowing that it's a British station, that knows they know it's a British station while actually everybody's cosplaying. He's setting up a different type of drama. Huh? He's sort of giving you a mask under which you can reveal yourself. I love this English phrase, act yourself. He's giving you a chance to act yourself. Yeah. There's a, lots to get into about how you can only be yourself when you're playing a role. But the question is what sort of role? The Nazis were trying to bring people into their spectacle, yeah. into their vast fascist theater where you were meant to play along, but where the Nazis defined your roles for you. Here, Delma was saying, no, you can join a different type of spectacle where you can act in your own self-interest, your individuality, express your resentment towards your leadership, and so on. You know what, I'm actually gonna pause there and we can discuss whether it has any relevance for today, because obviously Delma has many lessons, good and bad, um, many bad, by the way. Um, we can talk about that as well, for our current times, but, in my experience of looking at propaganda campaigns across the world today, we have so much more technological opportunities. We have so much more social science, sociology. We have so many more ways of analyzing target audiences, all that stuff. I've yet to discover anything which approaches the relationship between people and power and communication in a way that is as interesting. That was it. How many minutes was that? Oh, I can't hear you. I need to unmute. Sorry. My... Yeah. Oh, that was brilliant, Peter. Um, and let me ask you some questions. And uh, the audience, if you have questions, put them in the Slido app and I will feed them, feed them to Peter. So you mentioned this bifurcated self that um, Delmo has. And you yourself are somewhat bifurcated, right? I mean, you were born in Kiev and um, in the sort of Soviet era, grew up in England. Do you think that that attracted you to this particular character or it, it helped you reflect on him in ways that if you were less bifurcated, you might not have embraced the subject in quite the same way? I think we're all bifurcated. Um, I think this is this is everybody has and remembers playing different roles as a child and, and putting on different hats and experimenting, especially in your teenage years with identity. 
But I do think people who have been forced to move countries as a child, those jumps are more radical. And so without a doubt, I mean, there's several moments in my research where I was like, okay, I want to write a book. One of them was when I realized Elma was doing something a lot more sophisticated than I'd originally thought. And the other one was when I saw this connection. And the connection was actually very, very visceral. So Delma personifies, is personifies the right word? Delma summarizes, I don't know, um, his feeling outside in England, because when he arrives from Germany at the age of 13, when he sets foot on English soil after having kind of like thought of England as this sort of heaven for so long, and he arrives in England and he's surrounded by children laughing at him and they're pointing at his socks because he's wearing little Berlin sailor socks while English children wear woolly socks wrapped up to their knees. And the story of the socks kind of like stays with him his whole life. He carries on having nightmares around it. And when I was around, so I was four when my parents moved to, to London and I had a similar experience where my mother on a winter's day clothed me in, well, what in the Soviet Union would have known as Kajswane, which were basically a mix of long johns and tights, but they looked a lot like tights. And it got cold, so she dressed me in them and that was normal. And off I went to school, and I was just learning English. I was just starting to fit in. I'm getting changed for PE. I remember this in a lot of detail. And suddenly everybody is laughing at me, even the teacher, Mrs. Callahan. And they're all pointing at me and saying, he's wearing tights, he's wearing tights. And I'm like, are these a calzone in my accent in English? Uh, and just this complete sort of like, I've come from a different universe. So, so yes, his socks thing, it, it gets quite personal at times. I mean, I have to say in other ways, I'm very different to Delma, um, very different to Delma, um, very, very different to Delma. I mean, he, I have a real, after several years with him, I, to, I wouldn't say love, hate, but it's a kind of like, like dislike relationship I have with him. Why? <sighs> he did a lot of very, very dark things. Um, you know, we talked about sort of the purer things that he did just now. He did a lot of dark things. He he admitted to it himself. He kind of reveled in the idea of being a baddie. Uh, at the start of the book, he says, I'm a baddie baddie. He did lots of, you know, he'd write letters to grieving German parents as if they were from their lost children and say, oh, your son's, you know, dear Mutti, I'm still alive. I'm just with the British. It's great here. You know, this sort of wow. thing to undermine, to give them the false feeling that, their children were still alive and give them the, uh, and hopefully get them to tell all their neighbors that it was great with the British. Would I have done the same thing if my country was being attacked by Nazis? I suppose it is at the moment. I'm, I'm still very much Ukrainian. So, you know, when you're in the middle of a war, you maybe don't have the, you know, moral, you know, the, the space for moral considerations. But but there's lots of stuff that he does, which I talk about in the book, which make you go, ooh. Can I ask you about him and also the people he recruited for the broadcasts? Because, I mean, for them to be plausible, they must have been beyond bilingual Germans. They also had to be deeply, I mean, they had to pass themselves off as far-right Nazis, right? How did, how did he find these people? Who were they? So he selected them very carefully. There were people from the Berlin cabaret scene. Mm -hmm. um, so literally, you know, there's something very cabaret-like in his whole approach. And literally, there were people from the Berlin cabaret scene there. Um, there were a lot of German POWs who playing German soldiers. That wasn't, you know, that was less hard for them. There was a lot of exiles, a lot of, here's where it gets really interesting, a lot of Jewish exiles who were playing Nazis, essentially. So Jews cosplaying Nazi to subvert Nazis, which already is a fascinating kind of psychological jujitsu, which... There's very, very, I mean, I went through several memoirs of other people who work there, listen, like looking for somebody's self-reflection on this, but mostly they just sort of laughed. Um, Muriel Spark, the novelist, was there as well. And she just said the Jews really enjoyed this because um, it gave them a way to sort of like hit the Nazis back. I don't know. I, I, if I were to make a film about this, I would have a great time, I think, with, the, with actors really thinking through the psychological process of that. Um, so um, fantastic. I mean, a real sort of mix of scholars, spies. Ian Fleming was one of the, the author of Bond, was one of the people who made this all happen. He was at the Admiralty, admired Delmer's work, and supports Delmer at this moment when he's at risk of being shut down and helps him grow exponentially, really. Um, 
the first essentially professor of psychiatry and psychoanalysis at Cambridge. That wasn't his official title, but he was the first professor teaching courses on psychoanalysis at Cambridge. Um, and just this amazing array of sort of like um, scholars um, and the people who were most useless actually apparently were advertising execs. <laughs> it's like, so uh, I think one of the memoirs, one of the guys who ran this whole system um, said the newspaper men were really good at doing propaganda. Uh, the novelists were very good and the ones who were really rubbish were the advertising guys. <laughs> well, as you were talking, Peter, um, you know, and you were describing this sort of far right Nazi movement that it was sort of OK to listen to, if uh, or at least plausibly OK. It reminded me, of course, of the ultra nationalists in Russia. Uh, in the Ukraine war, who have been given some license to criticize Putin's Russia, although one of them recently committed suicide after a, uh, <laughs> um, which may have been a genuine suicide or not, but it's always hard to tell in Putin's Russia. Uh, but what are the similarities or differences between the ultra nationalists who have been given permission to some degree to criticize in real terms what's going on in the war? Uh, and, you know, is it just completely different or is there other of some? Mm -hmm. so, so, so there's similarities and differences. Um, the similarity is that, yes, in systems such as these, often the way, the place you can do the most visceral criticism is by going further right, or more extreme. That Russian propaganda under Putin is probably much more sophisticated in many ways than the than, than Nazis in the sense of understanding different narratives, because it's much more cynical than the, than the Nazi one. It doesn't exist, insist on that much as much ideological rigidity and they're much more flexible it's like okay let's let's do this over here and this over here and the idea of having these nationalists in the russian media space then only in the social media space they're not on tv um was to have somebody attacking the, the army so the army didn't get comfortable you know as a way to beat the army like hey we've got these guys to attack you by the way so they're playing different bits off to off each other which the nazis did as well but in russia it's kind of more public and um the difference is, though, that the ones in Russia are, when they talk about corruption in the army, they genuinely want an improvement. They want less corruption in the army. When Delmer's characters were talking about corruption in the army, he wanted people to be more corrupt. And the point was to be outraged about this terrible corruption in the army so that you can be more corrupt, you know? outraged by how Nazi officials' kids weren't weren't going into the army, so you don't have to send your son either. I mean, it was he was playing outrage in order to not help the other side. Uh, these guys actually do what Russians conquer countries and, and do really well. So um, uh, there's a bit of a difference there. Yeah. Um, and it's important to, re to remind the audience that it was a hanging offence to listen to the BBC or other... Right. I mean, this is this is kind of a fairly critical point in terms of how Delmer had to operate. Well, the BBC was to listen to. Um, you just have to do it very, very carefully. Um, it's interesting that in terms of viewing listening figures, according to surveys, by the end, Delmer stations, which had none of the brand recognition or none of the kind of like many, many, many wavelengths that the BBC had kind of had caught up and maybe even overtaken the BBC. So like 41% of soldiers said they listened to it. Um, the head of the SS in Munich says it's, these st Stelma stations are among the top three listened to in the city. So that's a bit like having a, you know, being right up there with, I don't know, Fox and MSNBC in your cable package. I mean, it's, kind of, it's huge. These weren't little psyops. These were like mainstream media. Um, so... BBC did have a lot of listeners. People had to listen to it in a lot of quiet and silence. Delmer's main gripe with the BBC was that it was preaching to the converted, was that it was just talking to people who already agreed with it. Its figures went up a lot towards the end of the war because as the British start winning, people want to listen to what the British are telling them because they'd be they'd be talking about whether they might, you know, about things to do with air raids and stuff like that. So the BBC got exponentially more popular like towards the end of the war, people were listening to it. And Delmer kind of stops his own broadcasts in the last bit of the war saying, look, they can just listen to the BBC now. Like there's no need for us to do this elaborate masquerade. You said you wrote this book during COVID and that you had access to the archives. So what were the archives? I mean, I started in COVID. I mean, there's there's a lot of the book is about Ukraine as well. So part of it is is in 22, but I, I got to I got to do a deep dive during COVID and I started it before COVID, but 
COVID was a time I could really not go anywhere. And the archive is collected by a remarkable historian and archivist called Lee Richards, without which, whom I could not have done this book. Um, Lee is a, um, he's, he's foyered tons and tons and tons of the classified um, archive of what was the political warfare executive. Um, and we have all these notes really in great detail of strategy, Delmer talking to his superior, saying why he's doing something. We understand a lot about what he was trying to achieve. Then there's the memoirs. Delmer wrote his memoirs in the 60s, which tell us a lot about his childhood, but which are as subjective and footnote free as you would expect. Um, some others, there were a couple of other memoirs that came up afterwards, all very vetted as wolves. I found the unpublished memoirs of several other members of the, of the organization. That was in the sense that I did, did something as I went out and found that. Um, the most remarkable one to my mind, they were all remarkable, but really remarkable one. I don't want to compare them. One really remarkable of all the remarkable ones was um, uh, given to me by Ian Fell, a former BBC journalist who'd interviewed Rene Halkett, a member of the Bauhaus group in Germany, who'd worked with Delma. And Ian had done incredible interviews with um, Rene Halkett before his death, and then they were unpublished. And he, he was kind enough to share that with me, which is so nice of him. Um, but the really delicious bit, again, one of the, again, again, one of those moments where, okay, when you're like, okay, I've got to write about this, is that even though we don't have recordings of the show, apart from a couple of tiny examples, or that I found, we have the transcripts. Because all this time, the US State Department, which was making faithful transcriptions of all Nazi propaganda, thought these were genuine Nazi stations. So the Germans may have cottoned on, but the State Department didn't. And actually, it's here, here in, you know, outside of DC, in that beautiful archive. What a beautiful archive you guys have. Um, I've forgotten what it's called. I've been there, but also, uh, again, Lee's gathered a lot of this stuff. There's all the transcripts, not all, many of the transcripts in German and English of these shows. So we have, we almost have the scripts. Well, we have the scripts. We don't know how they were spoken, but we have the scripts, which also makes it a lot of fun because one gets to imagine well, how how did the sound? So all those different data sources. Uh, then as soon as I started the book, I realized, oh my God, that's not enough. I need to understand how Nazi propaganda works because I've got to do both sides. And the book moves between, well, three places, like Bedfordshire, where Delmar is, Nazi Germany, where the Nazis are, and contemporary Ukraine. So there's sort of like, there's, there's, there's um, sort of three places of action, I suppose. Um, and um, that took a that took a lot of work, um, which again I, I stand on the shoulders of giants. There's obviously wonderful, wonderful historians written about life in Nazi Germany, but the real find for me for this project was a book called Nazi Radio Propaganda, which was written by two German cultural historians working at the New School during the Second World War and going through, obviously with support from the British and American governments going daily through Nazi radio propaganda and analyzing it daily. And they've written a book, which it's, you can get it at the new school. I got a, you know, it's hard to find, but um, which is a, the sort of day by day, theme by theme, narrative by narrative breakdown of Nazi propaganda called Nazi radio propaganda written by two writers who are famous. I think one is a cultural historian, the other is a psychoanalyst. I can't remember now, I'm having a brain fog, but people who write beautifully about culture writing in this wonderfully lucid literary prose about how this machine works. I mean, this should just be on everybody's desks. I mean, the amount of parallels between how Nazi propaganda works and propaganda today is fascinating. Because we always think about, you know, the anti-Semitic stuff and all that stuff, which is obviously key. But it's all the other stuff which resonates so much with today. Before we get to today, um... Yeah, you, know, you said something kind of striking at the beginning, which is Delmo was, and I'm paraphrasing, I think, the sort of special operations of propaganda. And it's interesting because, of course, special operations, as we understand it, um, you know, really originated with the SAS, which was founded uh, at the beginning of the World War, World War II, uh, which eventually, um, you, know, this, uh, you know, became, you know, the, the, SA, the SAS of today and the Special Boat Service. Um, you know, were the British more inclined to improvise? 
uh, for reasons that you might speculate on uh, outside of conventional kind of whether it's special operations or this kind of propaganda. So I didn't go into it much in the book. There is there is some good. There is some good stuff on this. Um, so originally this sort of. There was a huge fight between the Ministry of Information and the Special Operations Executive between who should control this. Is this the BBC and the Ministry of Information? This is their kingdom? Or is this subversive sabotage that world? And in a way, what Delmar is doing is between that. And there's a tug of war between the Minister of Information, who is Reith, and then a guy called, called Bracken, I think. I think Bracken becomes the Minister of Information. And the SOE, uh, who are doing really, you know, charged with setting Europe on fire, whatever it was, by Churchill. Uh, and it's the SOE who bring Delmar on. It's, he's got friends in the SOE, and they see him as someone whose mind is subversive enough to bring him into the propaganda apparatus. Then there's so many fights between them that in the end, they create their own organization called the Political Warfare Executive, kind of at the same time as, similar time as Delmar joins, which is in charge of all, should we call it communications? We don't want to use the word propaganda, from the BBC through to subversively flitting. Yeah which has um, a panel with both people from the SOE and the Ministry of Information, all fighting each other all the time, like a board, and then all bits of it doing what the hell they want. <laughs> so the BBC just ignores orders all the time. This bit is constantly in rebellion. I mean, there is, I, don't, I just don't do it in the book, but there is like, you know, there is just a comedy to do about the dysfunctionality of, of and the infighting and the territorial fighting between different bits of, um, British officialdom as they tussle over power. And I don't know, Delmer's boss for a while is Richard, Richard Crossman, who is famous for like, you know, someone describes him and like, you would phone him, you would tell him what to do, he'd put the phone down and then do exactly the opposite. So we've got to understand just how much, um, improvise, everybody was improvising, I think. There was a lot of insurrection all the time. Ever since 9-11 in the United States, you know, there's, you know, first of all, Al-Qaeda, then ISIS, and now with Russia and China, you know, there's been a fair amount of energy around the question of counter uh, counter messaging. Uh, some of it at located at the State Department in the uh, in the GEC, and some of it elsewhere. Um, you know, what are the lessons uh, for today for the the work that you've done on this book? Hi. There's lessons good and bad. Um, you know, Delmo. I mean, just dabble in disinformation. He did a lot of disinformation, but he came to regret it. You know, he really came to feel that it hadn't, it backfired on him in all sorts of ways. And also he got caught very fast. I mean, his early stations didn't try to let the audience know who they were. They actually tried to be something else. And they were fun and they got lots of listeners and they kind of crashed them. They kind of like, like flew too close to the sun. Um, and they were caught out pretty quickly. And then, you know, Gestapo was saying pretty fast, look, this is just the British up to their evil tricks. So I think there's a cautionary tale there about deception as being a really easy way or a seemingly easy thing to do. I mean, the other side's doing it. The Nazis were doing loads of stuff like this. So the other side's doing it. Why don't we? And if anything, Delmer's experience shows that the externalities are bad and you're going to get caught. I think his great insight is about his sober portray understanding of the limits of preaching about democracy and that you really have to understand people where they are. The way he's effects driven, you know, he's looking at a result. He's like, what are we trying to achieve with this? His notes are very terse, you know, they're like, like, we're trying to do this. We're trying to do this. It's very hard to measure, you know, effective communications, but he's always in that frame. You know, he's always in the frame of what are we trying to do with this? How does this hurt the Nazis? But then everything that I've tried to talk about in my little introduction today, I mean, he broke through the greatest echo chamber you can imagine. I mean, today we complain like, we can't reach audiences in echo chambers. They don't want to listen to the truth. Delmer's media had a, a so much relevance and so much emotional appeal and so much power for its audiences that they listened to it, even though they knew it was being broadcast in a real war, not a culture war, from the other side. They knew perfectly well the British, the people bombing them were broadcasting this, and yet they listened. 
a huge part of that is about the amount of detail about their lives that they could listen to there. Tell them to spend a huge amount of time invested into understanding soldiers' lives, understanding civilians' lives. And so he, he made his his broadcasts sound well and be relevant to his to his audience. So lots of things to learn, good things, bad things, um, and and things which which I don't think we do enough of. You know, President Joe Biden has made the threat to democracy kind of the main appeal in the election. And by implication, you may you seem to be suggesting that that's probably not a very effective message. No, look, rallying your own troops, saying what the stakes are, that, that can work. I think if it's just that, yeah, that's not going to be enough. That's too abstract. You've got to then connect that to and what does that mean for you? You know, um, just just an abstract stuff about, oh, I don't know, liberal constitutional theory versus another type of, you know, power arrangement that it definitely isn't going to do it. Um, but no, I think I think setting the stakes of something is really important. You know, you don't you know, you sometimes, you know. Sometimes that matters a lot. And Biden's doing it for his own side as well. We've got to remember that. I mean, he's really worried about getting out the vote. Delmer's dealing with a slightly different situation. You know, he's he's not worried about the British. He's just worried about the opposition. Um, so, so if that's the only thing the Democrats are going to run on, that's not great. If they then manage to connect that to people's lives without any kind of preachiness or cant, but in a really kind of visceral way, then I think, then I think maybe they'll not lose. <laughs> another, another sort of political question. I mean, people always decry negative advertising, yet everybody does it, um, mm. presumably because it's effective. I mean... And I'm talking about politics, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I remember talking to to in my last book. I went around and talked to a lot of spin doctors. That was my last book. This is not propaganda. It was literally that going around and talking to, especially ones from the dark side. And you know that's exactly the point they make. You know, no one likes to talk about it, but everyone does it. You know, <laughs> you, you you do you do both. You both come with your sort of big beautiful ideas, and then you you know hobble the opposition. Um, I mean, it's it's no one's saying it's a pretty game. Um, and it, I'd like to think that that. I mean, what I value in my sort of time with Delma has been less about that, which again, I think everybody does it. And it's not a huge surprise, um, even though it's always shocking just how dark and dirty it gets. It's the other stuff that, that he did, which I found really, really interesting. Yeah. So questions from the uh, audience. Do you see this more open-faced propaganda approach as a way to counter the misinformation narratives that are spreading virally today? I, I mean, Delma's not trying to counter narratives. Yeah, he he's trying to get to the audiences and find what they find interesting. He's not doing debunking. Uh, he's catching out the Nazis on their lies when it's really relevant to people. There's a long time at the start of the war when, when Goebbels doesn't want to talk about British raids on Germany because it makes the Nazis look weak. And so a lot of the radios are going, you know, why isn't Goebbels telling the truth about how Aachen was bombed the other day and how the air raid didn't work? So it's always getting back to when does truth start mattering to people? When do the facts start mattering to people? I'm not trying to like have a, a debate about that thing over there that we really don't like. But getting back to their lives and saying, okay, here is where facts matter because they affect your daily life and they mean something to you. So he, I, th I think he'd, do, he'd be, you know, there's two ways of approaching, well, there's many ways, but there's two big ways of approaching this information. One, one of them thinking about the kind of the product you know, or, or the supply and battling the supply. And the other one is thinking about the demand. Why do people want it in the first place? So he was very demand focused. Let's understand why people want this and how can we make them interact with another form of content. Mm. You mentioned Ukraine and that uh, a good part of the book is about Ukraine today. So how, how does that, how, did, how were you able to weave this all together? So the war kind of like rode a tank into my, into my life, into what I still consider is partly my country, though I grew up abroad, obviously, and um, into my into my book, 
Um, probably the last one is not as important as the other ones, <laughs> frankly. But the war broke out just as I was sort of like, you know, putting putting the things together. And um, I went on a journey right at the start of the war with colleagues from the Atlantic magazine to interview Zelensky. And this was in April, 22. And he was facing such a similar situation to the British <laughs> in 41. He was trying to communicate with Russians. He'd worked in Russia. He'd been quite a successful entertainer in Russia. And he was like, they're locked in a bunker. They don't want to listen to me. You know, preaching to them about democracy, about war crimes. You know, trying to tell Russians about, look at the war crimes you're committing. And it, it was his words. So people are in a psychological bunker. Um, so something else was needed. And it wasn't, you know, so I was just like, okay, how would Delmer approach this? And by the way, Ukrainians are doing loads of really, really inventive things. Um, I think most of the stories will only emerge after the war, hopefully, hopefully a victorious war. Um, but of the stuff that I'm told, because a lot of this comes from the civic center, they're kind of discovering a lot of this for themselves. So I met sort of activists who do kind of robocalls at Russians from mass calling Russians to try to get them to stop supporting the war. And at the start of the war, they did moral things. That's like telling them about war crimes. And that didn't really work. The minute they switched it to like, oh, the government's going to introduce a new tax to fund the war. People are like, well, mm -hmm. up what? Our money. Mm -hmm. And it was much more effective. Um, so that's that was kind of one of the pills that Delma wanted everybody to swallow at the start of the war. Like, stop. It won't, you won't win as long as you're talking about the stuff that you care about. If you want to win, you've got to stop romanticizing. You've got to stop hoping that there's some democratic uprising around the corner. None of that's going to happen. What you've got to do is crack the relationship between a Putin, other types of authoritarian leaders, a Hitler, and their followers. You've used the word bunker quite a lot. And I, you know, I don't know if you've read this book, Connected the Surprising Power of Social Networks by James Fallow and Nicholas Christakis. That basically the theme of it's it's, it's worth a read. It, you know, we're basically and it's kind of maybe this is tautological and obvious, but it, it it was revelatory to me because based on a lot of you know large data sets. I mean, we simply believe what everybody around us believe. The idea that we have independent beliefs is actually almost kind of insane. <laughs> if I'm I'm summarizing what is a much more subtle book, but this question of whether we you call it bunkers or we call it silos or whatever we call it and breaking through. Uh, I mean, you've raised a very interesting point. If you, in a sense, if you appeal to somebody's self-interest, they may be in a bunker, but if they don't, they don't really want to be mobilized to fight in a war that they may die in. Or so, ha, unpack all that both in Ukraine and 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 also in in World War Two. So you 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 said a very interesting thing there about everybody around people. Yeah. So Delma was very aware that. You know, the Nazis were trying to make it feel that people were part of a community, the folk. That was their mission, actually. I mean, they, they were very naked about it. There's very good work by, by Ian Kershaw and, and others about you know these attempts to create out of the pluralistic, chaotic German society, a unified folk. And that was meant to be your community where you went along with everybody else. And within which, you know, famously, people like Hannah Arendt would say that facts stopped mattering. All that mattered would be to belong and to listen to the leader. So one of the things that Delmer realized, and I think is very true today, is very few people are prepared to be dissident outsiders. Very few, very brave people. And yeah. they're incredibly important because they break through fear. But most people aren't going to be like that. They might even resent them because they're so brave. Most people are, are, want to be part of a group and get into the many reasons for that historically or civilizationally. And you've got to give them a different group. So... Yes, you want to be part of a group, but what Delmer is saying, you can be part of a group called, well, he had stations for believers. So the church is another group where you can have a different set of truths. Mm. Um, so soldierly camaraderie is a different set of truths. And there was always this tension between the Wehrmacht and the Nazi party. Yeah? So the Wehrmacht was its own community. Right. Um, and so on and so forth. Um, the Nazis were very aware of this. They're constantly trying to break these different divisions. If you listen to their speeches they're non-stop about this you know all the old divisions have broken down we're now part of one folk one community um so Delm was always very much okay you can be part of other communities and in that community there's a different you so Delma was i don't know he, he never believed there was a 
a true you outside of performance, but there were different types of performances you could do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there were some performances where actually there was more of you in them <laughs> than other ones. Um, so he was creating different stages, different fora, where you could be part of a different group and where you could behave differently and where you could be a different you. Um, he was sort of exploiting the fact that we all have slight, we have different selves. Like today, I mean, I, I researched on this at the LSC and now Hopkins, others do it in a much more dedicated way. You know, a group, a political group, a conspiracy group is one group, but the same people are also mothers and you know soccer soccer players or there are other groups that they're part of and so you'd approach them through their through that other bit of belonging that they might have i mean and of course uh ukraine and world war ii are very much linked because um today uh because a lot of russians believe they're fighting nazis and how you know how how has that been so effective so belief, yeah, that belief is a, is a good word. It's a very complicated word generally. What do we mean when we believe in something? And especially in a in a society with a sort of a kind of cult of cynicism, like it, as in Russia. Delma, and I, I, I don't disagree with him, Delma would have said that the power of propaganda, or I think Delma would have said, that the power of propaganda is not to persuade people, not to get them to believe in something, but to offer them ways to be what they wanted to be and think what they wanted to think and do what they wanted to do. So when, you know, whether this propaganda is effective, we can actually analyze because Russians don't repeat it domestically as much as we think. They, they, they focus on other things. But, um, but it's a long running one. It gives you several things. Firstly, it means that for the Russians who might in any way feel uncomfortable about this war, they don't need to feel any kind of responsibility because if they're Nazis, well, we can let go of responsibility. Mm. A lot of Kremlin propaganda, and probably also Nazi propaganda, but especially Kremlin propaganda is about giving up responsibility. You know? Nothing to do with me. Them up there, they'll understand, but they're Nazis, so they like, should probably do this. It gives those who desire sadism, and they might be a much bigger number than we'd like to admit, the legitimacy to do that because once you if they're nazis well then then you can do anything you want to them so we have dehumanizing so it's not really about persuasion propaganda works when it legitimizes things that are there already um that's just that's just what that's when it's effective when it's just trying to sort of convince people of something you're kind of in a bad place already have you ever read the novel by hans faluda every man dies alone no, but but the, an, another Hans Fallad an, a novel uh, makes an appearance in my book, um, Alone in Berlin. Maybe that's the same novel. Maybe it has got different. Maybe, maybe, maybe different. The same, but it, anyway, it's it's amazing. Yeah. Novel. It's my and I, I rarely read fiction, but but it, it it encapsulates a lot of things that you're talking about. Well, we can really nerd out here. So um, so in the book, which is set in sort of a Berlin working class suburb in the first years of World War Two, a couple outraged by the death of their son, go around Berlin, yeah, leaving little notes everywhere, postcards, on which are anti-Nazi messages, hoping through these anonymous postcards to inspire people, yeah, to express their, their, their um, resentments of the Nazis. This is an, an area of Berlin that had always voted communist. This is a working class area. And towards the end of the book, they get arrested. And the Gestapo man who arrests them says, guys, you realize all that happens is that people see these things and they're so overtly dangerous and rebellious, they bring them to us and give them to us. People are too scared to even hold them or put them back down because that looks as if they didn't do enough. You don't understand the society you live in. There's a very, very interesting moment in the book where... I think when the, when the Gestapo come round to find the evidence that this couple were behind these postcards, they find one of the cards in an old transistor radio set that the son who died belonged to. So they're caught because they'd left a piece of evidence in a radio. I was even going to do a whole half chapter in my book about this. 
Because what Dalman was saying, okay, I'm going to cloak the radio. I'm not going to be these obvious anti-Nazi things. I'm going to make it look like a Nazi radio and a Nazi postcard, which is very subtly undermining the Nazis. So there was almost like an opening that I was going to have a whole sequence in my book about the book, and then the radio would leap to Bedfordshire. But um, I guess I didn't, I didn't go full full pension in this book. I, I kept it quite conservative. Uh, a bit of me wishes I had, but but Hans Flader is in the book, but like literally it's one and a half paragraphs explaining that people were really scared and therefore you needed to do all these weird masquerades. Well, Peter, um, thank you uh, for the brilliant presentation. Uh, thanks to the audience for tuning in. If you want to buy the book, you can on the button on the right. And good luck with your book tour, Peter. Um, and thank you for appearing today.